Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Fossil Friday Chats. We had a little bit of a break that last week, but we are back. I am Brittany Stoneberg from the Western Science Center. With me, as always, is Gabriel Santos. Hello, everybody. TGI Fossil Friday. Woo! -hoo. And joining us today is a, a person I'm very excited to listen to today is Shamindri Tenakon. Uh, so great to see you, Shamindri. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited. Yeah, oh, yeah. here we're going to hear about snails today. I'll hail the invertebrates. Mm -hmm. You guys did, our, our viewers were like, you know, we'd really like to see some invertebrates. We'd really like to see some botany. And we are trying to provide. I'm so glad <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, if you guys aren't familiar with um, Shimindri and her work, she is an invertebrate paleontologist working with fossil mollusks and sand dollars. Uh, she's a PhD student at the University of Florida, go Gators, and works at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Shimindri grew up in Sri Lanka and lived there before moving to Florida for grad school. So, yeah, all about snails and, yeah, coming to... Uh, University of Florida, uh, where we've had many uh, UF uh, graduates and students on the on the uh, Fossil Friday chats in the past, so we're glad to have one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Well, if everybody's ready, if you have questions for Shimindri, go ahead, put them in the chat that as always we will go ahead and get to as many as we are able uh, after her talk during the q a portion so um i expect there will be lots of questions about snails um i don't know much about snails so i'm excited to learn more so shimindri whenever you are ready go ahead take it away tell us about cassid snails awesome thank you um we'll go ahead and get started so thank you so much for having me um, so before I start talking about cassids, I'll go ahead and share my story, how I fell in love with invertebrate fossils, especially mollusks, and my journey up to now uh, as a PhD candidate in invertebrate paleontology at the University of Florida. So I'm from Sri Lanka, and for those of you who are not too familiar with Sri Lanka, it's a country in South Asia. And as you can see in the map, it's off of the southeastern coast of India. 
It's a beautiful island, roughly around the size of West Virginia, or one third the size of Florida. <laughs> I grew up in a city called Candy in the central part of the country, and I've included a photo of Candy in the bottom left corner. Um, if you can, I definitely recommend a visit to Sri Lanka after the pandemic is over. <laughs> so Sri Lanka is an island with a tropical climate. It is also a biodiversity hotspot. Um, uh, along with the Western Ghats Mountains of India. So there are a lot of endemic animals and plants which are only found in Sri Lanka and restricted to some areas in the island. So the, since the country is surrounded by the ocean, marine life is abundant and there are interesting coastal and marine habitats like mangroves, salt marshes, seagrass beds and coral reefs. Um, so sharing a little bit about my childhood, as a kid, kid I was very inquisitive, well according to my family that is, and loved to explore and also do experiments. Um, I would go on local expeditions and spend time bird watching and observing plants and animals. Sometimes I would do this with my cousins, um, we'd have a lot of fun um, doing that. and. If I remember correctly, this photo was taken right before one of my local expeditions. So you can see me backpack ready, hat on, ready to go out to the wild. <laughs> so I also loved going to the beach. I loved looking at shells and intertidal sea snails at low tide. Um, and I photographed the mud snail that you can see in this photo. Um, I was fascinated with marine life and also fossils, and I watched a lot of documentaries on Discovery Channel, which was broadcasted in our local networks. Um, so I loved biology in middle school and high school and wanted to learn more about the living world after finishing high school. So I got selected to the biological sciences program at the University of Peradeniya in Sri Lanka. And in my second year or sophomore year, I took my first course on invertebrates and was intrigued by their diversity and biology. I loved looking at specimens during labs and enjoyed going on field trips. Um, I selected zoology as my major and was selected for the zoology honors program. And as a part of the zoology honors program, I had to complete a research project or an undergrad thesis. Um, so I very much wanted to work on, paleo on a paleontology project and was thrilled when I got the opportunity. Um, so I joined the paleontology group in the evolutionary biology lab and started working on my project. Um, so for my research project, I looked into the systematics and morphology of a marine snail group, serid gastropods, in the Miocene deposits of northwestern Sri Lanka. Um, and I got the chance to go out to the field with the group. It was an amazing experience collecting specimens from the outcrops and processing them in the lab afterwards. I also got to present my research at a conference. Um, so I wanted to continue research in paleontology after graduating. Um, I wrote to prospective advisors and to grad programs. It was a very difficult process and took quite a bit of time. I nearly gave up on my hope of joining a paleo grad program. Um, and during that time, fortunately, I got to work as a teaching assistant and a research assistant, but in a very different field. And finally, after what felt like a very long time, I got into a graduate program. So that's how I ended up in Florida. So I was admitted to the PhD program in zoology at the University of Florida and became a member of the Koloski Lab Group and the Invertebrate Paleontology Division at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, so I work with an amazing group of people and have had many opportunities and gained so many experiences during the time I have been here. And for my PhD or dissertation research, I work on several different projects which involve fossil mollusks and sand dollars or echinoids. And I will be talking about one of those projects in a little bit. Um, so I thought it would be fun to share some of my experiences as a graduate student. Um, so among the experiences and opportunities that I have had during grad school, I think field experiences are some of the best ones. Um, I have participated in field work in localities in Florida and other states in the southeastern US. Um, these trips are memorable experiences, exciting and sometimes scary, like almost getting bitten by a cotton mouth in a creek while looking for fossil lachinoids. I was so distracted. Or coming across a rotten deer carcass in the wood. That was not fun. Um, in addition to visiting fossil outcrops, I have also joined sampling trips uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, where we collect sediment samples consisting of dead and living invertebrate specimens, which are then used for conservation paleobiology research. 
Um, so for my research, I sometimes look at specimens reposited in museums. So in addition to working at the Invertebrate Paleontology Collection at the Florida Museum of Natural History and gaining experience in curatorial techniques, I have gotten the chance to visit other collections to look at their specimens. So for example, I visited the Moss Collection at the Department of Paleobiology at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in 2019. And I also got to visit the National Museum of Natural History in Paris, France. That was a wonderful experience. So I also get to present my research at conferences or professional meetings. I really enjoy attending these meetings to get updated on current research, attend workshops, and catch up with colleagues and friends who are based at different institutions all over the country. Um, and that's the most fun experience of attending a conference for me. Um, so this is a great professional development experience, conferences, and they provide many networking and potential academic and professional opportunities for students and early career professionals. Um, so I am employed as a teaching assistant at the Department of Biology at the University of Florida. Um, so in addition to uh, doing my research, I get hands-on experience teaching undergraduate students. Um, so the best experience I've had so far is going to the Bahamas for a four-week immersion course on invertebrate biodiversity. Even though it was stressful at times having to coordinate everything and take care of the logistics, I loved it. It was a wonderful time. And this was at the Juris Research Center in San Salvador. So um, one of the most rewarding things I get to do is participating in outreach activities, especially with kids in local communities. Um, so before the pandemic, we had in-person activities at the museum uh, and also at other locations um, with uh, hands-on activities for kids. Um, however, it has become difficult to conduct in-person activities during the pandemic. And I did get chances to participate in a couple virtual events recently. And one such event was for a group of high school students in India, where I talked about paleontology with a colleague of mine, and I loved how we were able to connect with each other despite the geographical distance. So that's one good thing with um, virtual events. Distance is not a barrier. Um, so today I'm going to talk about one of the projects that I'm working on for my PhD. So cassettes are a family of marine predatory snails, which like to feed on echinoids, including sea urchins and sand dollars. So there are a couple of images here showing the cassettes attacking their prey. Um, so the smaller cassettes, which are only around two to three inches in length, are commonly called bonnet snails, and the larger ones are called helmet snails. For obvious reasons, they look like helmets. So, so some of those can actually grow up to almost a foot, and they can be very heavy. Um, they're usually found on the seabed, buried under a thin layer of sand, and, be, and can be found from the intertidal zone and up to about 100 meters in depth in tropical and temperate waters. Um, so cassettes have long-lived planktic larvae, which can travel great distances, resulting in their widespread distribution. Uh, and cassettes do have beautiful ornamentation, as you can see here, and they're used for ornamented purposes, but unfortunately that means that they are exploited by overfishing, and yeah, that's a little sad. Um, yeah, so cassettes are also related to other predatory snails like tons, tritons, and frog shells. And the giant cassid that you see here, which someone's holding in his hand, is a cassis tuberosa or a king helmet, which is found in the Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico, and also the Caribbean. And cassis flamea, which is um, just right of that photo, is another cassid that's found commonly in, the, in Florida and the Bahamas. So cassins are active predators of echinoids, um, which are sea urchins and sand dollars, and they leave behind distinct drill holes on the test of their prey. Um, cassid predation is well studied on modern day echinoids, um, and they are terrifying predators. So even though they are slow, the chase is very thrilling and scary. It's like watching a cheetah attacking its prey, but in slow motion. Um, so the figure on the left shows how the cassid attacks its prey. Um, it pursues the urchin, snares it with an extended proboscis, and uses toxins. Then it engulfs the test with its foot 
and cuts a hole and punches the test in, making a cylindrical hole, um, also called a drill hole. Um, so the poor echinoid is not in good shape after that. Um, so the images on the right show a drill hole on a sand dollar um, and also some urchin tests that have drill holes on them. Yeah, so traces resembling cassid drill holes are quite common in fossil echinoids. However, they are understudied compared to mollusks that have drill holes. So studying about these interactions using these traces and also the fossils of the predators and the prey will help us to better understand predator-prey relationships through time. So I won't go into too much detail on drill holes since there was a great episode by a colleague of mine, uh, Lindsay Farrow, on this topic, and I recommend you to watch it if you haven't already seen it. Um, and the, all the images here are of fossil echinoids which have drill holes in their tests. Okay, so even though there are plenty of drilled echinoid fossils, when looking at the fossils of the predators or the cassids, unfortunately, there are preservational biases against these gastropods, causing them to not preserve as well in the fossil record. Some of them have thin shells and are found hidden under a thin layer of sand, so the shells can get destroyed easily. And these shells are made of aragonite, a form of calcium carbonate, and they do not preserve well in some environments which prefer the preservation of another form of calcium carbonate, which is calcite. So in such environments, there won't be any body fossils. Um, we can only see moldic fossils, and those look like the specimen at the top left corner of the slide. And we have to make 3D replicas to understand how the shells would have looked like. So fossil cassids are an underexplored group when compared to their prey, but important because of their paleoecological relevance as the predators of echinoids, as one of the predators of echinoids, to be more correct. So today I'll be sharing a story about the fossil cassids from the Upper Eocene Ocala limestone of Florida. Uh, and they are estimated to be um, of the late Eocene, about 35 million years in age. And most of these specimens are from the invertebrate paleontology collection at the Florida Museum and were collected from the locality named AL004 or the Hale Quarry Complex, which is in Alachua County, Florida. It's the county that I am in. Uh, it's only about 20 miles for, from where I'm at right now. Uh, so commercial mining of limestone has been happening in this area since the late 19th century, uh, and the environment of deposition of the Ocala limestone in this area is interpreted as a warm shallow sea. Um, in this locality, echinoid fossils with drill holes are common. However, cassid fossils are pretty rare, and all of them are moldic with very few complete specimens. So moldic fossils are understudied compared to body fossils because um, it's not easy working with them. And the cassids from the Eocene are particularly interesting because this is presumably the time when the cassids diversified, which is an important event in the fossil record of echinoid predation. So during the past four decades or so, um, only about 70, 75 cassid specimens have been collected from this locality. So it's not that much compared to some other fossils that are found there. Um, and as mentioned, they're all moldic and most of them are incomplete. So it's very easy to miss them in the um, outcrop or the spoil piles where they're found. So when I first looked at these fossil cassids, it looked as if there are two or more morphologically distinct taxa or morphotaxa present. So some have angled, widely spaced, few axial ribs, such as the examples on the left, and others with densely arranged vertical and narrow axial ribs, like the ones on the right. So we wanted to know what's going on. Are there different morphotaxa, or is there high morphological variability within this one species? What's going on? So since all specimens are moldic or impressions in the rock, we made room temperature vulcanizing silicone peels as positives of the external moldic specimens to get a better idea of how they look like. 
Um, so these silicone peels end up being 3D replicas of the shell of the actual cassid and helps us to extract morphological characters and measurements from the fossils. So I enjoy making silicone peels. I love arts and crafts. Um, it's one of my hobbies. I love to paint. I love to do um, pottery. And this is like making fossil pottery. It's very de-stressing and relaxing, except at the very end of the process where the peel is pulled out of the rocks and always fingers crossed that it won't break and get stuck inside the specimen. <laughs> So our specimens from the Ocala limestone were compared with other described Eocene cassids. Um, there's only one described cassid from the Ocala limestone, which is Phallium globosum, um, which is on the top left corner of the slide. And this specimen is the described type spe specimen, which is at the Smithsonian Museum. So I observed morphological variations in the peels and also the specimens. Uh, I compared our specimens from the Ocala limestone with other described type specimens and also the species descriptions of um, Phallium globosum and also other Eocene cassids from the United States and the Paris Basin. I compared our specimens with other specimens available as well. So I also took measurements of the specimens, including widths and lengths of different shell structures, which would help to analyze the variation in shell morphology. So after observing over 70 uh, specimens reposited in our invertebrate paleontology collection and also from recent field collection trips, I observed a gradient in their shell ornamentation based on axial rib density and morphology with specimens ranging from those having slanted, widely spaced axial ribs to specimens with densely arranged vertical axial ribs. So axial ribs are the prominent ribs which extend uh, from the top to the bottom of the shell and can be very clearly seen in the last walls of the shells. So the morphometric analysis that I did using the linear measurements that I uh, extracted from the specimens also support this observation. So moving on to morphometric analysis, some stats. Um, so these are analysis looking into morphological variability using variables or measurements. So I carried out a principal component analysis or PCA, which is a multivariate statistical test using the linear measurements that I extracted from the specimens. Those are the widths and the lengths of the shell. So this is an ordination plot um, where PC1 and PC2 axes are plotted against each other. Um, it's basically um, sh showing a morphous space, how different specimens um, are similar to each other or how different they are. So here the specimens are represented by points and the aquamarine points represent specimens from the AL004 locality from the Ocala limestone and the gray points represent other cassid specimens from the Eocene, uh, which are from several different species and regions. The Ocala limestone specimens do not form a distinct um, group in the plot and they're variability, which is represented by the variables that were measured, is very high um, because they're spread out all over the MOFR space. Um, the PC1 axis represents most of the variability, even though size is a large component of that variability, the shape also changes along these axes. And when I plotted um, PC2 versus PC3 to get rid of the size variable, the high va variability could still be seen in the plot. Um, so the size of the points here represent the axial rib density. The bigger the point, the more axial ribs. Um, there is variability in the axial rib density of all your seen specimens. However, a gradient in rib density is clearly visible only in the Ocala limestone specimens. So here's another plot. This PC ordination plot only consists of the specimens from the Ocala limestone. Um, the gradient in their axial rib density is clear in this plot where the size of the points range from few to many and form a gradient. So higher negative values in the PC1 axis correspond to larger specimens and the size decreases moving from the left to the right 
of the axis. So larger specimens are represented by points towards the left of the PC1 axis, while the smaller ones are on the right hand side. So it appears that there is no clear correlation between um, the axial rib density and the size of the specimens. So what are the conclusions of this project? So it appears that the cassettes from the AL004 locality of the Ocala limestone, which initially appeared to belong to two or more morphologically dis distinct taxa or morphotaxa, is most likely one species showing extreme variability in its morphology. This might suggest intraspecific ecophenotypic variation or basically variation within one species and no other gastropods or any other invertebrate fossils from the same locality, so such high morphological variation. And it is also very interesting um, that the age of these highly variable specimens correspond with the diversification of cassids during the late Eocene. Um, there are some specimens here which are comparable to the described species uh, of cassid from the Ocala limestone, Phallium globosum. So we think it's the same species, but with extreme variability in shell ornamentation. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you so much. That was great, Shaminji. Thank, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for, for having uh, me. Uh, yeah, I really love how you talked about making uh, molds was like paleo pottery. I was like, <laughs> that's the kind of pottery I can get my get myself doing. <laughs> I love doing it. Um, it's so fun um, making the molds, but it is a little stressful at the very end when you have to pull it out because um, sometimes with the spires of the snails, they can be very narrow and it can be a very narrow hole. So if it gets stuck, then you really can't pull it out of it. So you can't even make another one because it's already like inside obstructing the fossil. <laughs> so... <laughs> That must be so nerve wracking trying to like create a mold of like one of the only specimens you might have. I just like, oof. Yeah. So I have a really quick question before we get to some uh, audience questions. During your talk, you talked about how like the snails had like aragonite shells versus like um, calcium carbonate shells, you said, right? Yes, yeah, so calcitic shells. Um, so Aragonitic um, shells, like aragonite is a form of calcium carbonate. It's just the form of the crystals that are formed. So um, with the gastropod shells, when they're made out of aragonite, they don't preserve in um, some of the environments where another form of calcium carbonate crystals is preferred, calcite. So the echinoid tests, they preserve so well because they're ideal for that um, preservational environment, but the snail fossils, like the body fossils, don't preserve. They just dissolve away, leaving just an imprint on the shell. So it's like a footprint almost. <laughs> Why is it that some snails use aragonite versus um, uh, calcite? Yeah. Um, I think that's... Um, so when the snail... I think this is what happens. Like when the shell is secreted, that is the form that... Um, that's being used um because like with the fossils i guess they don't know that they're going to be fossils <laughs> so if they knew maybe <laughs> they change the form of the crystal but i think it's to do with the biological process of um, um how the shell is made but that i don't know sense. too much about it but i should read up on it a little bit more those darn snails, they didn't know they were going to become fossils. Come on, guys. Gosh, they should have thought ahead. <laughs> like, for, for a lot of those, uh, for a lot of snails and, like, uh, you know, shelled animals today, they talk a lot about ocean acidification, kind of like, you know, having a lot of these snails ruin their shells and things like that. Is Was that something that happened in the past, too? Um, so depending on the climatic conditions um, with the um, dissolved um, CO2 levels, um, then that would result in the, um, the carbon compensation depth. So that would cause um, it may, that would make it easier for some things to preserve better than others. Um, so it all depends on the changing climate. 
Got it. All righty. Well, we've got some great audience questions, so I'm just going to go through. Um, this first one is from um, it's a weed, and I apologize if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name. Do borings of cassids and other gastropods um, differ in morphology, or are they recognized only by preferred substrate and co-occurring body fossils? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yes, so... Um... So cassids do make drill holes on the echinoid tests. And we also see some other drill holes which are made by parasitic snails called eulimids. And those are typically smaller and have this characteristic dissolution halo surrounding the hole. And then sometimes uh, when we look at moon snail borings, because those are pretty common, especially in bivalves. So um, those have kind of like a different shape to the drill hole, like there's a big old structure. Um, uh, so sometimes it is a little hard to, you know, like identify a drill hole because sometimes like um, preservational processes can also cause damage to the test of the specimen. Um, but compared to, so what, what's done is like, we have a pretty good idea about how the drill holes look like in modern specimens. So by, by looking at the morphology of those drill holes, um, we find comparable ones in the, in the echinoid, like the fossil specimens. But sometimes it is tough. It is tough to identify them. <laughs> awesome. All righty. Here's one from Andrew. Uh, do the different Cassid invariants uh, show different stratigraphic distributions in the Ocala limestone? So the interesting thing is no. They're from like, yeah, so that's the interesting thing because they're oh. not from um, different, um, well, they're from the same locality, but then they're all from the same um, stratigraphic location. So yeah, that's the interesting thing because it looks like they all co-occurred together. So they're not from um, different places in the outcrop. Huh. Interesting. Weird. <laughs> Very weird. <laughs> and oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, because this was the time when they were experimenting. They were diversifying at this time. So they were probably trying out different, you know, like morphologies to see which was going to be more effective. And then with the ornamentation, like sometimes with the ribs, um, it could be an anti predatory defense because cassids also have predators, especially these smaller ones. Because these cassids aren't that big. They're only about, even the biggest specimens are probably around two inches long. So these are like the smaller cassids, not the big ones. Um, and they, and sometimes the ribs also provide some anti-desiccation um, properties as well. So really don't know what's going on. <laughs> Very interesting. All righty. Do you have like a, do you have a specific cassid snail that's like your favorite like morpho Ooh. shape on the shell? Um, that's a good question. I... I would like to think of them all as like, you know, my favorites. Uh, <laughs> Choose between your children. Yes. So I do like the ones that are like completely preserved because it's easier to get measurements out of them and also see how all the structures look like. I do like some of the tiny ones. Um, they're very cute. Um, I would say I do like the ones that have the the widely spaced um, axial ribs, but I also like the ones that are like more kind of just like the ornamentation is really cool with all those like really packed ribs. <laughs> so I love all of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Very democratic. I'm sure. I'm sure none of them heard that. They're all fine. <laughs> When you're like trying to find these snails, like in that limestone quarry area, and you said there's only been 70, you said that's been found. How is it like, what is it like, like trying to go through and find one of these? Is it just a lot of like picking up rocks and like trying to find something? It is so difficult. Like I'm so bad at picking cassettes. Like I go and I try looking for all these moldic fossils because because they, they look like holes in the rock and you really can't like say what's what by looking at it. So I just collect a bunch of things that look like cassettes, but then 
Most of them aren't. I'm really bad at it. <laughs> Thankfully, our collections director, Roger Portel, is really good at um, identifying everything, basically, including cassettes. So thankfully, you know, like, he, he, yeah, I'm so grateful that he's there. <laughs> this is why it's I'm, important to have people with different skills out in the field. Yes. Yeah, I'm but really have, bad at prospecting. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> but I really am. I have collected some things by accident, which are like really cool. So yeah, <laughs> they might not be the things that I'm looking for, but they're still pretty cool and awesome. So I'm happy. That's like the best part of paleo is like sometimes you find the greatest thing when you're not looking for it. You're just like, we're out here to look for like a little little whale or a little whale or something. All of a sudden you find a complete like undescribed like skull and you're like, well, we weren't prepared for this, but I am much happier. <laughs> but, here, but here it is. <laughs> okay, here's another question. What's the duration of sedimentation of strata at the site and do they represent constant environment? Um, so I, I guess it's the time duration. Just to I think clarify. so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes. Yeah, so all of these are um, dated from the um, uh, late Eocene. They're all like around 35 million years old and they're from the same depositional environment. So it was um, like an open, uh, warm, shallow sea. Um, and we also see a lot of, in addition to the cassid gastropods, we do see several other gastropods. Most of them are moldic, but then we do see a lot of um, bivalves um, and forams, which are microfossils and also some corals. So it's the typical shallow water environment. Um, some bird fossils as well, but mostly in birds because there's more of them. <laughs> All right. Here's another question. There's a lot of good questions in this chat. People were obviously very engaged with oh. the, with the cassids and snails. Uh, how do the uh, this is from Brett? How do the cassids uh, bore holes? Uh, sorry, cassida bore holes differ from those of other snails? How can you tell by looking at them? Right. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, like um, sometimes it's very difficult to do that. Um, but depending on the snail, um, some do make um, drill holes that are different from the cassid drill holes. Like as I said, when mo moon snails drill, it looks very different from the cassid drill holes. And also on the echinoids, um, we do sometimes see small drill holes, which um, also have this like weird dissolution halo surrounding it. And those are typically from the parasitic uh, gastropods, the ulimid snails, which are a lot smaller than cassids. And those also make drill holes, but we can determine from the shape and the size or the trace morphology to say more formally. Cool. <laughs> All right. Oh, I like this question. This is from Alton. Do cassids have significant predators? What could possibly want to eat these beautiful snails? <laughs> Uh, you mean yes. the terrifying predators? Okay, yes. <laughs> so I'm not sure about the very big cassids because those are really big and they have very thick shells. But with the smaller cassids, um, there are some like big crabs that just go for them. They love them. <laughs> I don't know if people eat them though because I feel like with conks and some other gastropods, people do eat them and they taste pretty good. Uh, but I haven't heard of um, cassids being eaten. Like humans do fish for them. As I mentioned, some of them are overexploited, sadly, because they look really pretty and they're used to make ornaments and people just sell them for a lot of money. So that's really sad. But I don't think humans eat them. I should look into that <laughs> if cassids yeah. are a delicacy. <laughs> <laughs> I am how admittedly big? curious. <laughs> yeah, how big can cassids get? Because the one you showed yeah. us in that photo where the person's holding in their hand look huge. Yeah, I think like even a foot long. I've seen a couple wow. are like giant. So they would fit as a helmet on a human head. Ah! <laughs> it would be really heavy. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Pretty big. Okay. My goodness. Um, okay, I'm going to ask one of these questions first because I think um, Kat, Turk, your question I think is a perfect note to end on. So uh, this first question is from Subashi. Is extreme morphological variation a common occurrence in gastropods? Um, not so much. Oh. Um, so um, 
as I said, this might be because they were diversifying at that time. So there are some gastropods that do show um, high morphological variability, but I've never seen one to this extent. Ooh, that's interesting. Like, Makes, for, you know, because, like, there's, yeah, like, these are such really cool, unique animals. And, like, for a lot of folks, when we talk about paleontology, we just talk about, you know, they just think about dinosaurs and things like mm -hmm. that. But, you know, me and Brittany are big fans of invertebrate and paleobotany. And, like, how, how would you tell people why they should care more about invertebrates? Like, why, why should they think that they're important? for science and paleontology? That's a very good question. Um, so with most of the invertebrate fossils, um, so as you, as I mentioned before, there like we find so many fossils, even in the same location or locality, we can sometimes find like thousands of like one species of snail or bivalve. And they're really important to uh, for like paleoecological studies because um, those help to understand how the environment was and how it changed over time and also for um, like um, climate studies and um, even even if you're not looking at the ecology by looking at the chemical composition of these shells using isotopes. Um, so then like it's possible to see how the climatic changes have, uh, how the climate has changed over time. And um, it's mostly because of the sheer number of specimens. They preserve so well in the fossil record, thankfully because of their um, <laughs> skeletons. So um, the shells do preserve really well. So invert taxa are really useful to um, find answers for important questions like the impacts of climate change and also to answer like um, evolutionary questions as well. Awesome. So and also for conservation. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, also for conservation paleobiology, which is a very cool oh. discipline where um, like the, the techniques and principles used in paleontology are applied for the conservation of modern systems. So, um, and then again, like we use mollusks for a lot of the conservation paleo work because there's so many and they're comparable, the living communities with the past communities, we can compare them and see what's going on in systems mm -hmm. to get a better understanding of how can how they can be conserved in the future. That's so cool. That's awesome. I love that kind of concept of, you know, we always talk about using the past to understand mm -hmm. the future, but now we can also use the past to save the future mm -hmm. too, yes. which is like a, such a cool, mm -hmm. cool concept to talk about. Lab Very. motto. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, Brittany right. and I are going to be on a, on a mission to help have, have everyone that watch Fossil Friday Chats to really, really learn to love and appreciate the invertebrate fossils because exactly. they're super underappreciated. They really are. I remember yeah. the first time I went into, uh, you know, I work in vertebrate paleo, which is awesome. But the first time I saw an invertebrate paleontology collection, I was just overwhelmed. It was amazing. Yeah, I mean, our collection has like millions of um, specimens. It's, yeah, it's amazing because there's so much knowledge that's just waiting to be explored in there. <laughs> yeah. And all the other collections, I mean, everywhere, they're so important. That's why like the preservation of collections is also a super important mm -hmm. thing, um, even for the future. Um, yeah. So if there's any future paleontologists um, watching this and thinking, you know, what can you study besides dinosaurs? There are literally millions of inverts to study. So yep. think about that. <laughs> Alrighty, this is a tough question from our friend and previous Fossil Friday Chats uh, speaker, Kat Turk, who's asking, where's your dream field site? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Kat. Maybe she's bringing the hard hitting questions here today. <laughs> um, I mean, Thinking of logistics, somewhere that's easy to get to, I would say. Um, <laughs> that sounds so boring. I'm sorry. Fine. <laughs> because I have, like, especially I remember in Sri Lanka, um, getting to the sites, it was so difficult. And that limits our, like, ability to collect specimens too. Um, I would say like a beautiful location. I love, you know, like places that are really beautiful. Um, 
the quarry system that we collected the specimens from, they're nice. I think I did share a couple of photos of that as well. It's a quarry, there's some water, it's cool, it's close by, but I do love going to sites um, in locations that are beautiful. For example, I um, did go to a uh, uh, fossil bed in the Bahamas when I went there um, to teach the uh, invertebrate biodiversity course, and that was beautiful. I just like spent some time looking at the specimens that I could see. Um, the, the ocean was right next to us, and oh. it was awesome. <laughs> that sounds so good. <laughs> With the cassids, of course, like, you know, an ideal location would be where there's plenty of specimens, either take it off from the outcrop and... Yeah, just like anything that helps answer questions with tons of specimens, with well-preserved specimens. Um, I do also really like the some of the locations in South Florida where there's a ton of specimens. They're really big, um, lots of invert fossils. Um, access is a little bit restricted um, at this point because there's a lot of development going on. But I did get a chance to visit um, one of those locations in Sarasota, um, maybe like a couple of years ago before they closed it off. And uh, the there's like gigantic gastropod and bivalve shells. They're so beautiful, so well preserved. Those are all body fossils. Amazing. <laughs> I love the idea of doing field work and like once you're done, like for the day in the quarry, mm -hmm. just walk a few feet, relax on the beach right next to the ocean. That sounds choice to me. That just sounds yes. so I good. Agree. <laughs> well, I guess that does it, right, Brittany? Yeah, except we have one more question, which I think is oh, just perfect. fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think everybody kind of knows, you know, paleontologists, we like to buy things with our taxa on them, you know, so... You know, we love to buy dinosaur themed merchandise, but Dawid is asking, do you owe any own any themed items like a mug with a cassid, a t-shirt with a cassid, draperies, anything? <laughs> I would love to. Um, so <laughs> this was like pure coincidence. I once bought a shower curtain and for some random reason it had a cassid on it. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> I wouldn't have realized it was a cassid if I was like not too familiar with it. I would have been like, oh yeah, cool gastropod. But I'm like, no, this is a cassid. Like I can definitely identify the features. Har, <laughs> job. And um, I do have some stickers of cassids, but I probably should, you know, make some custom made, um, you know, like maybe a cassid dress, like with a cool cassid <gasps> print on it some cassid jewelry, there's okay. lots of um, ideas, but I do have some paleo themed um, accessories and stuff like that, obviously, like my Nautilus earrings, or I have a bunch of stuff, <laughs> but um, unfortunately, not so much cassid stuff. Hear that, uh, got... manufacturers? There's an open market here. <laughs> yep. Yeah, come on, internet, let's get some really cool cassid fashion going, it'll be great, we could set up an Etsy page, I'm all here cassid for it. Look. <laughs> I am all in. <laughs> well, to kind of uh, end things off, Shaminji, like um, we have a lot of folks who watch the show who are interested in paleontology, looking to get into the field. Um, what's like a piece of advice you'd like to kind of give someone who's interested in going into paleontology? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um, so I would say like um, sometimes... Um, well, with my case, like it was difficult to find a grad program. It took a while, but don't get discouraged. Like um, uh, just keep going. And then for, I would say, um, if someone's interested in pursuing paleo um, in college, like to do um, some geology classes, like take geology classes, take um, some biology classes. Those are gonna be really important. And then um, I would say just write to people. There are so many people who are out there who are willing to be mentors because I think mentorship is so important for success um, in grad, like for grad students and everyone basically. So I think um, finding a good mentorship network is very important. Um, and yeah, like, reaching out to folks, especially on social media, like Twitter. Um, I think most people are like happy to help out. They, everyone's really busy, but at the same time, you know, like I, I love, you know, um, helping out um, younger paleontologists, you know, to get into the field. Um, I, I think that's super important. So 
yeah, just like don't give up, be passionate. Um, also just like, yeah, like following people on social media, I think is really good because then you can sort of like get an idea about what sort of research is being done um, and get an idea of what someone wants to do in future. <laughs> Well, thank you. That's really, really wonderful advice. And I hope people were taking notes at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for folks who'd want to like learn more about you, your research or, where, you know, the Florida Museum, where's the best place for them to go to? Yeah, so um, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Shamindri T. Um, I think I did have it up on my last slide. Would you like me to share it again? Or oh, we have it. We have it up on the screen. Oh, perfect. Perfect. So, um, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, uh, and then I, I do not have a website yet, but there will be one coming up soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll be sure to link those in the description below. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining us on Fossil Fry Chats. Thank you for sharing that wonderful story. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And again, all hail the invertebrates. <laughs> yes, yes. All hail the invertebrates. They're so cool. Well, thank you so much. It was awesome. Thank you for having me. Of course. And thank you so much to all of our viewers for joining us in today. Um, if you like this program and want to support programs like it at the ALF Museum and the Western Science Center, you can find links on how to do that in the description below. And as always, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel for more stories from the world of paleontology. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.